Okay, good afternoon. Uh, look at the bright side. Your tummy is full, you're happy, and uh, don't fall asleep. Uh, I have, this actually buzzes people, you know, you get a little electric shock. So you better be awake. Okay. Uh, this, this presentation is about reporting results. It's, uh, okay, you've done the trial, you got the results, and now you're going to publish the results. And this, this presentation is about, you know, tips, you know, ideas, recommendations, uh, issues about publishing the results. But I, uh, I wanted to actually, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to say this at the end of this presentation. This is the, the last one that I have. And I wanted to say it at the end, but I'm afraid I'm going to forget. So I'm going to say it at the beginning. And what I want to say is I want to thank FIO Cruz and NIH and particularly Laura Lee for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here. I really appreciate that. So, okay, so we, we can start. This time I'm going to try to use both microphones because I'm going to show you examples of tables of, from publications and I may move to, to use the pointer. So we're going to start with an introduction. And we've already did this part, right? What is the most important part of a clinical trial? Is the primary uh, research question, the main research question. Now, we haven't done this part. How good is the primary research question? Okay, it's actually a pretty simple test. And the way I see it is if at the end of the day when the trial is all finished and the data are analyzed, will the answer to the primary research question, remember this was the most important thing, will the answer to the primary research question advance scientific knowledge and or clinical practice. So if the answer is yes, it's a good research question. So it's really that simple, at least in my mind. If the primary research question is important, the answer is important. So you're going to say, well, yeah, of course, uh, that's trivial. Well, some people think, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, that if you get a null result, then you know, that's not good. So, and what I'm saying here is if the question is important, regardless of what the answer is, it is important. Assuming that, you know, whether it is positive, negative, or null, as, assuming as the, that the trial was conducted properly and everything was done properly, of course. So, but if it did, everything was conducted properly, the answer is important. And, um, this is, I don't know if you, you here in this country have the same experience, but in the U.S. from time to time, it does happen, I wouldn't say rarely, but I, didn't, I wouldn't say also often, somewhere in between, that people call a null result as, oh, that was a failed study. You know, and I, I really don't like that n name. It's a, 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 it's a failed study. And I actually, once at a DSMB meeting, a data and safety monitoring board meeting, we were, you know, we were presenting the final analysis to the board, and, and one of the DSMB members said, oh yeah, it was, it, it, the, the result was null, and the DSMB member said, oh yeah, it's a, it's a failed study. And I don't speak at DSMB members because I'm just sort of, I'm not a member of the DSMB and I'm the part of the, sp the sponsor rep, so I, I tend not to speak, but this kind of annoyed me so much that I said, excuse me, it's not a failed study. It's a, it's a, it's a null result. Actually, it was a very well conducted trial and the lead investigator did a very good job. It's just that the result was null. That's okay. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a failed study. Um, but the DSMB member is from FDA, just happened to be, and in their world, a null result is a failed study. 
for pharmaceutical company, I can understand that, you know? If, if you know, you spend millions of dollars hoping you found something and you get a null result, it's kind of a fail. But for, for us at NIH, I assume for Fio Cruz, you know, uh, um, it's, not, uh, it's not a failed study. And I, I, I feel pretty strongly about that. So, yes, of course, we would prefer to find a positive result and find the cure to cancer, of course, uh, but it doesn't mean it's a failed study. So, a null result advances scientific knowledge by eliminating an ineffective treatment from the list of possibly effective treatments. So, that's moving science forward. And actually, yesterday, the, the uh, Natanson, Chuck Natanson's presentation with the meta-analysis, I mean, he he kind of reminded me something that was, you know, I should have thought about, which is, you know, you could have a null result, a study with a null result, but, and you can have many of those, but when you do a meta-analysis, you know, even though, if, if they're all in the same side of the no effect line, and they're all null, you know, you could, I'm not saying you will, but you could, maybe by combining them, see something. So, so it's not something, oh, null result, garbage, and that's it. No, and I, I feel pretty strongly about that. And we talked about the second most important part of a clinical trial, and it's the primary outcome measure or primary endpoint. And we also talked about a good primary outcome measure is clinically meaningful and simple. So I'm not gonna go over those. Um, what is a pr primary analysis or primary analyses? Or what, what's the primary manuscript? That's just a name. I mean, it's not like the official. But to me, a primary manuscript is, is, is the document that you're going to publish uh, that is really answering the primary research question. I mean, that's just common sense. So it includes results from the primary analysis, okay? So you have one model, primary analysis, or test, or whatever. That's the result. But also, you could have results from other analyses that are basically important to interpret the main conclusion. So because we get a lot of questions, well, should we put this, or should we not put this in the primary manuscript? And the answer is, it, you put, of course, the primary analysis, the results from the primary analysis, but anything that is secondary that helps the interpretation of the main conclusion, and there could be s quite a few, that's also important to put in the primary manuscript. So subgroup analysis, and I want to, you know, make it clear the difference between subgroup analyses and secondary analyses. Subgroup analysis is basically on the primary outcome, but for subgroups, okay? So, and, and the subgroups are defined based on baseline characteristics, pre-randomization characteristics. But it is on the primary outcome, so you are analyzing still the primary outcome. And I'm gonna talk about secondary, the difference bet between that and secondary, uh, analyses. So, subgroup is defined based on baseline characteristics. So, examples of uh, subgroups, you could have gender, uh, race, ethnic group, age group, socioeconomic status, geographical location, severity of disease, comorbidity. All these are examples of subgroups. So, you want to know if the primary outcome is different for the different subgroups. So they focus on differences in treatment effect, like I was saying, among some groups of trial participant. Now here's what's important. Is it pre-specified or is it not pre-specified? You know, I, every time I show the, the slides, I say, well, duh. You know, do we need a PhD statistician to say, oh, is it pre-specified or not pre-specified? But it is very important. That distinction is very important. Actually, it's a, it's a theme in, 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 to me in, in analysis of a clinical trial. The pre-specification is extremely important. You're going to say, well, why is it that important? To me, when something is pre-specified in the protocol, it tells me that the lead investigator is saying, you know, 
I think that there may be something in this, and I would like to test it. That's, so there was a reason why, you know, when maybe it's, you know, serious reason or not serious, but it was serious enough, the reason was important enough that the investigator thought, I'm going to put it in the protocol. Whereas if it's not pre-specified and all I see is, you know, one analysis with a significant result, how do I know that it is, you know, it was an important or it was one of 200 analyses that the lead investigator did and is showing us the one that was statistically significant? How do I know that? But if it is pre-specified, you kind of have a document that says, this is really what I thought even before I started the trial. To me, it's extremely different uh, situations. And typically, the trial sample size, and we talked about this, is not based on subgroup analyses. And I think, maybe it wasn't during the lecture, but afterwards, uh, somebody, yeah, somebody made a very good point, uh, which is, and I, I didn't say it back then as an answer, but you know, you, the question was, do you want a power to secondary analyses, if you remember? And, and I said basically no, in a, in a, in a more <laughs> a longer way. Um, and, and then the person came and says, but you know, you may want to calculate the sample size for the secondary analysis, and if it's not too much more, you might as well. So if you're saying, you know, 1,200 for the primary analyses, and if I do a power analysis for the secondary analysis, I get 1,300. Well, okay, so you know, you do 1,300 instead of 1,200 to get one bonus one extra analysis. That's a good point. But typically, I mean, at least the, the trials I've seen, we just focus on the primary, get the, the sample size on the primary. Um, I, I, really, I really like this table, and I wanted to show you a way to present subgroup analysis. And I think it is, I don't, I, can you read these things here? Can you read them? Or is it too small? Hmm? Okay. So, so this is a table that presents uh, subgroup analyses, but quite a few. Okay, but it presents it in a very concise and compact way. It has lots of uh, uh, information, but yet it's kind of clear. It's not like all crowded in. So let me, let me tell you what, what this is showing. First, it has the subgroup. So it has gender, age, diabetes, yes, no, hypertension, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's got the categories of each subgroup. Then it has, this is a trial, actually, where is Maria? It was done in Spain. I don't know if the author is Spanish, but it was done in Spain. Uh, it was a, a, a trial of three diets, two Mediterranean diets and one control. So they combined the two Mediterranean diets, and here's the control. So here's the relative risk. We talked about relative risk for male, for Mediterranean diets. The relative risk for control for males. Then you have the hazard ratio with the confidence interval. So you also see a picture. You get the hazard ratio with the confidence interval in numbers rather than in a picture. And here's something also very nice of the table. They have the p-value for the interaction term, which is really the way to find out whether there is a uh, treatment by subgroup interaction. In other words, if the treatment is different for the different subgroups. So this says for males and females, the direction is, is the same as far as the diets is concerned. If for males it was here and for females it was over here, then you would have seen an interaction term. Okay, so, so look at this table, how much information it has and it's, it's all in one table. So I thought I would put it as an example. You have the, the reference and you have the, the, the full reference at the end. So oh, 
but by the way, you, you can ask a question anytime. So just raise your hand. Um, now, secondary analyses are, well, the, all analyses other than the primary analysis. That's another duh kind of thing. Sure. And they're pre-specified or not pre-specified for the, exactly the same reason, you know, whether they were put in the protocol from the very beginning or were they thought about afterwards. And if they were thought about afterwards, how many were thought about afterwards? That's important. And again, same thing, the sample size is not based on the primary analysis. But the secondary analyses are, are done on important endpoints other than the primary. Remember, subgroup analyses are done on the same endpoint, the primary endpoint, but for subgroups. Secondary analyses are mostly, are mostly done for just different endpoints. Okay. They could be, for example, on other additional assessment uh, collected or site characteristics or economic analysis or genetics. All these are secondary analyses. So, Subgroup or secondary analyses, they are very important, even though we, we mentioned this the other day, even though maybe they're not powered, maybe you're not going to get a significant result, but they're very important because they give ideas to future investigators about what's going on. And if they see something that's going on, the same thing over you know, different trials, even though they were not significant, it may, you know, tell, tell a story, a real story. So they're very important. They are uh, valuable for generating new hypotheses. They should be based on clinically possible, plausible hypotheses. What this is saying is don't just run things on the computer and just spit out p-values, whatever it is, what, whatever outcome with whatever, and then say, okay, now give me all the p-values and I'm gonna look for the significant ones. It has to have some plausible reason why you're running this. They should be pre-specified because a pre-specified analysis, whether it's subgroup or secondary, to me has a lot more weight. The result of a pre-specified analysis has a lot more weight than something that was thought about later on. Now you're going to say, well, you know, we couldn't, t we, there was no way of knowing that we could see something and all that. Well, yeah, but still, I think it should be noted. They should be limited to a handful. Well, you say, well, okay, I'm, if, if, if it's important to pre-specify, I'm going to pre-specify 100 secondary analysis and I'm okay. Well, no, you, not really. They should not be interpreted as definitive results, and that's very important. They are not definitive results. They are just clues. You know, they just give ideas, seeds for other hypotheses. And their limitations should be clearly reported in the manuscript. So you should say this was a pre-specified or not pre-specified. And it has limitations, it has caveats. Okay, so that's a little bit my, my introduction. And now we're gonna start with the publication of results. And I'm gonna uh, start with uh, something that's getting a lot better in general in the scientific community. And uh, I, you know, I feel very strongly about it. And it, it is absolutely imperative to publish clinical trial results. And if you don't do that, I think and maybe I'm using the word ethical a little bit too loosely, I think it's unethical. Unethical, I would go that far to, to, if, if you don't publish the results of your trial. You're gonna say, well, wait a minute, why is it unethical? Well, I can give you actually several reasons. One, you have subjected participants, you have subjected participants to risk, there's always risk, Remember, participants are not patients. So you were not doing what's best for the individual. You were, they were volunteering to be part of the trial. So this was a good thing they did. And basically, you subjected them to some risk 
And then at the end of the trial, you say, well, I didn't get a positive result, so therefore, you know, I'm going to file the report in the drawer and never sit. So, uh, to me, that's unethical from that perspective. So that's number one. Number two is, you know, a, an investigator who doesn't publish result has basically wasted resources. So, you know, we have multi-million dollar trials where, where I work, and if you don't publish the results, that's not different from taking million dollars, and it's taxpayers, because NIH is the government, so it's taxpayers' money that you're basically throwing in the garbage. I mean, let's face it, isn't it? I mean, it's the same thing. So that's the second reason. The third reason, and it gets, you know, it, 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 the third reason is you are not telling the scientific community something you know. So you found something, you did a study, it was well conducted, it cost million of millions of dollars, and then you're not telling the scientific community what you found out. So you are keeping that result to yourself. That's not good. But you can go even worse. Not only you're keeping it to yourself, but you're misleading the scientific community. Why? Because now all the, all the null results are in the drawer and all the positive results are being published. So if I have one positive and nine null, I put the nine in the, nine in the drawer and the one gets published, so what's the conclusion? What is the world going to see? It's going to say, oh, this treatment works. But it doesn't because nine, it didn't work in nine trials. So, so not only you're keeping the result to yourself, you're actually misleading the scientific community. So, you know, and, and it's getting a lot better. I mean, publication bias, we call it publication bias. I don't know if you have the same term, publication bias in the US. Uh, it, it used to be pretty bad, uh, but now it's a lot better. Um, um, journal editors, Journal editors are, are making statements. We want to publish. There is a journal on, on null results. I, I don't know the official name. It's, it's a journal of null results. Uh, I think that's fantastic. I really do. Uh, so, and, and especially nowadays where it's all search engines, it doesn't matter really uh, where it's published. It's, it's out there and you can find it. Uh, it's not really buried in some library, and unless you actually physically go to the library, you will never see it. You search and you find it. Okay, please. É, a gente realmente sabe, né, que é, coisas podem acontecer, pesquisadores podem publicar ou não seus resultados. Mas eu digo o seguinte: aqui no, no Brasil, as legislações brasileiras para pesquisa clínica envolvendo seres humanos, ela já prevê isso. Então, quando a gente submete um projeto de pesquisa ao Comitê de Ética Local ou mesmo à Conep, tem a Resolução 466, que prevê uma série de documentos ou declarações que você precisa encaminhar junto com o seu protocolo, com o termo de consentimento. E uma dessas declarações diz o seguinte, que ela é assinada pelo pesquisador, e fala o seguinte, que os resultados do estudo, os resultados da pesquisa serão publicados, sejam eles favoráveis ou não. E o pesquisador precisa assinar essa declaração e ela é encaminhada para o CEP como um documento obrigatório no, no, no packing list. Né? Então, é, é, a gente entende que ele vá seguir aquele documento que ele mesmo assinou. Né? Então, é só para dizer assim, que aqui no Brasil já há realmente essa preocupação de que se publique os resultados sendo favoráveis ou, ou não. I have a simple answer for you. Good for you. Good for Brazil. Uh, I don't know if we have the same thing. We have, we have uh, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk about this and what we have similar to this in the US. Uh, but that, that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about signing a document that says we promise to publish our results. I, do, do we have, I, I didn't think so. I think that's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. So what do you do if a, a journal, so, so okay, you, you're the investigator and you say, I promise I'm gonna publish. And then you send and they say no. And then you send again and they say no. So what do you do? 
I'm going to drive the cameraman and the microphone people crazy. É, a legislação diz também que o pesquisador ele tem uma responsabilidade civil sobre o seu projeto de pesquisa. E todos esses documentos, uma vez que eles são assinados, eles precisam ser encaminhados em sua via original. Então, eles têm um valor legal. Né? E agora, eu acho que pode ser também uma, uma responsabilidade do patrocinador né, cobrar... Do, do, do pesquisador, enfim, né, a publicação desses resultados. Mas eu digo assim, ah, ele assinou, falou que vai fazer e, e não vai. É muito da questão ética do profissional ou do, do patrocinador. Né? Mas a gente entende que é, é um documento legal que ele está submetendo a uma entidade regulatória responsável. Well, th thank you for bringing this up. I had no idea, and I, I don't think we have something similar. So, okay, and that's that. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. We have in the U.S. Um, clinicaltrials.gov. Have you ever heard of clinicaltrials.gov? Yeah, I see some head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, and, and, and first is journal editors that a lot of journal editors say we will publish. We have a, a journal, well, we, I don't know if it's an, an American journal, uh, journal, but there is an, a, a journal that publishes null result trial. So that's number two. Number three, now with clinicaltrials.gov, uh, everybody is supposed to register a trial. So at the very least, at the very least, the world knows that there was a trial. So they can always say down the road, well, you know, you said you were doing this trial. Where are the results? Now, whether they're published or not, at least we know it exists. Before, we didn't even know there was a trial. And you, I, was, I was told by somebody, very nice, I'm glad I forgot who it was, this is the same, very similar. It's a registration of clinical trials. Is it just Brazil or is it like... South America? I think it's more than Brazil from what I read. But anyways, something very similar. So, you know, you say, why is statistician getting so passionate about this? I don't know. <laughs> But uh, it, it's the bias, I guess, maybe. It's the bias that, you know, part of the story is it's not the bias. Laura Lee says it's not the bias. Yeah, right, right. We don't like bias. You know, when you show only part of the picture and always the, the good part, it, that's, that bothers statistician. I don't know. But Ex excuse anyways. me, please. Just, just a comment. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Just a comment. Uh, I don't know if it, nowadays it keeps the same, but not very long ago, there were many pharmaceutical companies that um, um, to sign any contract for uh, taking on a, a clinical assay would have to, to we have to sign uh, many papers telling the data belonged to the pharmaceutical company, not to the researcher, right? So if they wanted to publish, if they wanted to uh, make known the results they would otherwise they wouldn't so i don't know nowadays with new um, legal framework here in brazil how things are going but it used to be like this well, okay i i think i understood your comment but i want to make a point and if it's really irrelevant to what you're saying please tell me but to me it's very different data and results are very different things results on data Well, it, it's results on data. If you, s well, well, no, I, data, I can understand data belongs, even though the trend even on data is moving to public. But I can understand a pharmaceutical company not wanting to release data. We call it participant level data, okay? You know what I mean? Okay, so each row is a participant, participant level data. I can understand a pharmaceutical company not wanting to publish participant level data because uh, the, anybody can, though, can get, try to start seeing things that the pharmaceutical doesn't want to reveal. But on the primary analysis, 
I think it is the obligation of anybody to publish the results. Now you're going to say, well, I mean, they pay for it, it's theirs, they don't want to publish, it's theirs. Well, but let's not forget that this is not something they did in their own building. They subjected, now you're going to say it's not a waste of money because that's their money. If they want to waste it, that's their business. It's not like taxpayers' money and you would be absolutely right. But let's not forget that the subjects that volunteered for this, you know, you subjected them to risk. They volunteered and basically you're saying everything you did is worthless. I'm not going to do anything about it. To me, that's, that's not to mention that it is misleading for the community. So, uh, again, it, it, there's a distinction between data and results. I um, agree with you entirely. You know. yeah. So, here, I mean, this is an example, and I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know the details, but this guy, Tom Jefferson, it's not our president of 200 years ago. It was in 2006. He, he did a Cochrane review on, I can't even read this, Neura Mini Days inhibitors, which were approved in the US and Europe for treatment and prevention of influenza A and B. I mean, just like what you know about statistics, medicine, I know just about this much. So, so I don't know the details, but what I know is this guy did a Cochrane review in 2006 and, and basically found that, you know, yeah, it was, it was this, this medication was actually effective. Then I forgot the details, but somehow he found out that there were actually lots of trials that were not published on this. So he did another Cochrane review in 2014. And I'm going to give you the reference of this whole story, and you can look it up if you want to. But he did another Cochrane review in 2014, and he found out that, no, actually it is not, because all the null trials were kind of in drawers. They were not published. And so this, this author, who, who, who you, you can find in the reference, wrote over $20 billion of public money has been spent on stockpiling drugs, this drug, uh, for uncertain benefits and decisions were based on incomplete data because the funding was done between those two Cochrane reviews. Uh, so, it, you know, it is, it, the whole point of this is there are real consequences. It's not just, you know, a statistician talking. And just to make the point that, you know, things are getting better, and I don't want to sound like, oh, we have a question? Oh, okay. It, it, In Portuguese, please. What, Portuguese? Well, I can try that talk in English, but I think in Portuguese it's easier to me. <laughs> é, nesse exemplo anterior que você estava falando sobre da influenza A, seria o Ozeltamivir, é isso? Was it what? Ozeltamivir seria a droga. Oh. Tamiflu, Tamiflu. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one second, I have it in my notes. It was about Zanamivir. Ozeltamivir, yes. And actually, and o, ah, Ozel, é outro? Ozeltamivir. Ah, Ozeltamivir, ok. É, a minha dúvida é que, no mesmo, esse ano ainda, o tempo de validade deste medicamento foi ampliado pra, de dois para cinco anos pelo FDA. E... Acho que há uns dias atrás teve uma pergunta sobre como que é feita essa conversa com o governo para alterar o, o, a rotina, o, tudo que é feito. Então, como é que uma, uma droga que acabou de ser publicada na Cochrane, que a, a, a eficácia não é, não é aplicável, aumenta o tempo de validade para cinco anos? Quer dizer, durante cinco anos vai continuar não fazendo efeito? Eu não sei... Eu achei meio contraditória a posição do FDA em relação à publicação na Cochrane. Eu queria que você comentasse só. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I, I, I got the question. So you're saying, how do you, once, uh, I'm not sure it's, if it's one of two questions. Are you saying, once we know now with the revised Cochrane review, 
how do we change the government rules or are you saying now that we have new information about the shelf life? Yes, I'm we have a new information about the shelf life. The shelf life was, uh, um, it, it, it is large. Yeah. It's extent. And, but uh, it's a drug that doesn't work. Okay. So why are we extending the, the, the life, the shelf life? for a drug that doesn't oh, work. Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> so they have a way now to increase the shelf life, but, but it's still, I mean, the, the short shelf life didn't work. They already increased the, the, the FDA, uh, okay. authorize, authorize, uh, authorize the, the extended shelf life okay. for five years, I think. Okay. It's too many. <laughs> okay. Well, my boss tells me I need to move on. So, I, thank you. No, thank you, but I, I, I don't have a clever answer for your question. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's because it's something that it's, I worried about because we work with this drug. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So, so this thing says, you know, you've got an editorial in JAMA Psychiatry that says negative finding in methodologically rigorous study could appropriately temper the enthusiasm. I, I really like this quote. It could appropriately temper the enthusiasm for and the adoption of ineffective medications. And these types of studies should be included in the scientific literature. Uh, so, you, so the community are all excited about something and it was never proven to be efficacious. And they're saying Sometimes it is appropriate to find a null result so that the enthusiasm goes down a little bit. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You, you know, we, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Till what time? 2.30? 2.30, okay. All right. Okay. I'm, although the field of statistics is rooted in mathematics and mathematics is exact, the use of statistics to describe complex phenomena is not exact, and that leaves plenty of room for shading the truth. It's easy to lie with statistics, I like this talk, but it's hard to tell the truth without them. So, uh, Friedman et al., it's a book, and they have the whole chapter 19 dedicated to reporting and interpreting results. And this is what they say, this is a quote from the book, and I, th I think it's very appropriate. To communicate appropriately, the investigators have to review their results critically and avoid the temptation of over-interpretation. They are in the privileged position of knowing the quality and limitations of the data better than anyone else. And the word, the key word is privilege. And Christine, I think it was on Monday, also use the word privilege for investigators. Privilege. In other words, it's, it's an honor to be a lead investigator and to have the power of moving science. It's a privilege. So don't, let's not mess up our privilege. That's basically. So therefore, they have the responsibility for presenting the results clearly and concisely together with any issues that might bear on their interpretations. And in that book, there is a whole bunch of references. So I'm going to, you know, it's just a list of references. There's not much to say. But there is, I put them in two slides. One are, is the references on general guidelines. And this, the, the book is from 2010, and there may be newer ones. But uh, so th this list of references is for general guidelines on how to report results. And this next slide is on specific guidelines. So for example, so the first one is basically how do you write a manuscript? This one is, for example, how do you write results for, from non-inferiority or equivalence? Or how do you write results from meta-analysis? Or how do you write results from subgroup analysis? Or how do you write results from safety? So, so these are kind of specific guidelines. Checklist of key elements in published reports on clinical trials. This is, you know, it has a lot of common sense. You know, I don't want to talk too much about it. But, you know, uh, 
you know, it, it says the primary research question uh, is, is it, you know, you have to say what it is, is it, imp why it's important, uh, description of the intervention, primary and secondary outcome measures, eligibility, blinding, randomization method, planned statistical analysis, planned interim analysis. So it, it's a list of things, you, as, a, as a checklist of things you want to make sure that are included in the, uh, in, in the, in the manuscript. So the concert uh, flow diagram, something you want to put in a published report, and this is an example. It's a little bit, uh, you know, complex because this was a, a five-arm, five-treatment uh, uh, trial, and, and, and Laura Lee showed sort of the, the, the top part earlier where you, st you start. What's important is you start with the, those who were, who were approached and with assessed for eligibility. That's where you really start, and then you explain why they were excluded. I mean, you can't read this, but why they were excluded, and then you go down to randomization. They call it here alloc allocation, uh, and then the five arms. That's called the consort diagram. That's pretty typical to put in a manuscript. Another thing that's very typical to put in a manuscript is the baseline demographics. Uh, or clinical characteristics of each treatment group. So, for example, usually it's table one. It just happened in my example. It's table two. Well, okay. So, so basically, you know, you've got the two arms, and and you state the baseline characteristics. Uh, you know, remember baseline is the same as pre-randomization. So everything you found out about your sample that's before the randomization, you put it in this table, and you show, you know, how it. You're basically saying, this is my sample, folks, world. This is th these are the people who came to the trial. And not only the, 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 the combination of the two, but by arm, so that you can see exactly the way things are. There's no imbalance, or maybe there is, whatever. But I, I investigator, I'm showing the scientific community exactly the kind of people that were enrolled in the trial. And, and that's important. Whether the trial worked as planned, you want to say that in your published report. A clear description of the statistical method Excuse used. Me. Yeah. Can we come back to the table, please? Yeah. I was just wondering, is that possible or I don't know if, if uh, it's necessary. Every time you compare, like uh, if for, for gender, for instance, every time you have to compare gender and then put the, the p-value, things like that, Excellent question, and I'm going to talk about it in about two minutes. But thank you for the question. Uh, you want to say whether the, the trial worked, uh, a clear description of the statistical method used, and whether they differ from the planned analysis. Basically, be transparent, and a clear description of the results of the primary analysis, including multiplicity adjustment. Do you know what multiplicity adjustment is? When you have several hypotheses that are all primary, you don't compare each one, the p-value to 0.05. There is a, a statistical penalty because you have several. And that's because the type 1 error you know, is kind of messed up. And I, I can, we can talk a lot about this, but bottom line, simple language, is when you have several primary hypotheses, several primary hypotheses, you can't, you have to adjust for the p-value. Or you either adjust the p-value or you change the point of five to something else. Have you heard about Bonferroni? Bonferroni adjustment? That's, uh, that's an adjustment for multiplicity. So multiplicity means you have multiple hypotheses. And I'm going to show you an example. I'm going to show you an example. So, okay, it's not two slides. It's more than two slides. But it is there, I promise. So here's, here's, here's a, uh, from the abstract. It says, purpose objective, to test the effectiveness of two interventions compared to usual care in decreasing attitudinal barriers to cancer pain management 
decreasing pain intensity, and improving functional status and quality of life. Okay? So you read the objective. This is in the abstract, so obviously it is very important. Objective, purpose, objective of the study. You read it and you say, okay, what's, what's the big deal? Uh, there's no big deal. It's certainly not wrong. But let's look at this statement a little bit more closely. Two intervention compared to usual care. Okay? So you have A, B, usual care. So you could do A versus usual care, B versus usual care, and if you're interested, A versus B. Right? So we have three possible comparisons. Right? Remember three. Now, let's look. We are going to test for decreasing attitudinal barriers to cancer pain management. We're going to study, compare decreasing pain intensity, improving functional status, improving quality of life. Four outcomes. Four outcomes times three comparison, that's 12 tests, which are, looks like they're primary. You're going to say, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong about it. There's nothing wrong about it. The only thing you, you have to make sure is when you have 12 primary hypotheses is that you do a multiplicity adjustment. And I took a workshop with a statistician who works for, I don't know if he still works with Pfizer or used to work for Pfizer. His whole role at that pharmaceutical company, his whole role is multiplicity adjustment. So my point is, he has a book on multiplicity adjustment. So my point is, it's a, it's a very, you know, uh, uh, you need to be an expert to, to, to know exactly. Of course you can do sort of, you know, things that are reasonably good, uh, but, but it's, it gets complicated very quickly. So my point is to understand what it's about so that you can go to your statistician and say, what about multiple, I heard about this multiplicity adjustment thing, I don't know anything about it, but I know that if I'm asking too many questions, I have to worry about it. If you do that, you're already in a very, very good shape. So, and that's the purpose of me mentioning this. So treatment adherence, you wanna talk about treatment adherence in your published report, the, ex the extent of missing data, safety information, clinical implications of the findings, so what? You know, okay, p-value, blah, 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 significant, f, degrees of freedom, blah, 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 so what? That's what this means, clinical implications of the findings. Comparison of the findings with those from other studies. Is this, you know, is this consistent or is it kind of different from what has been published? Both are very important, you know, not because it's consistent, it's, it's good, and if it's not consistent, it's bad. No, no. It's just scientific information. Results of subgroup analyses and limitations. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start a list. I think I have 15 recommendations and just talk for a couple of minutes on each. Okay? Any questions other than the gentleman's question? who's still waiting. Okay. Well, let's start with the first recommendation. You may publish trial design before the trial is completed. It's actually a very good idea to do that for two reasons. One, while the trial is ongoing, you're not worrying about so much about writing the results and all that. So you write the design, because remember, the design is, you have the protocol, right? You started the trial. So while the trial is ongoing, it's a nice time for the lead investigator or for the investigators to write the manuscript that describes the, the trial design. And what's nice about it, as a bonus, when you publish the results, one, you don't have to worry about describing the design. All you have to do is see paper X that has all the details about the design of the trial. So you don't have to repeat this. So think about it, it's, it's, it's actually a, a good idea. 
you may publish baseline characteristics not by treatment condition before data lock, and, uh, but after recruitment is completed. Uh, do you know what data lock means? Do you know what, w not how exactly it's being done, but what's the concept data lock? It means, you know, the trial is finished and you clean the data, meaning you look at anything that's missing, that doesn't look right, blah, 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 blah. And you've done that and you basically lock the data. You say, that's it. Once I lock, I can't change the raw numbers. Raw meaning like the, the actual data. I cannot change that once I lock because that avoids people from saying, oh, you know, I don't like the result. Let me look. Oh, yeah, this, this number doesn't look right. I'm going to change it and I'm going to rerun the analysis. Uh, to avoid that, we say we, we, we lock the data before any analysis is done. So it's a good idea if you want to publish baseline characteristics, pre-randomization, but not by treatment group but do not present or publish or report preliminary post-randomization results before data lock. And I've seen that. Some people say, oh yeah, we're running this trial and it looks good so far. What do you mean it looks good so far? Oh yeah, you know, the, 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 it looks like the, the new medication is working. Have you finished the trial? No, no, but it looks good. You know, and you say, well, what's, what's wrong with it? Well, I mean, it, it, it biases things. Again, statistician gets all nervous about bias. It, it, you know, it says, well, if it's going well, good. We're going to continue doing what it, we're doing. If it's not going well, you know, let's look further into what we're doing because it looks like we need to fix something. You know, it, it, it's human nature. It really is human nature. I mean, as much as you want to be honest and all that, Avoid statistical tests and reports of p-values for differences in baseline characteristics between the treatment group, the treatment conditions, although some would disagree. And that's why I didn't want to, because it was a little bit more complicated to answer your question. Some would actually, actually say, so here's, here's the two views, and I'll tell you my view. My view is what number four says. Uh, some people say, you know, any imbalance is part of chance because you did, assuming you did randomization, you did everything right, any imbalance is part of chance, is part of the type one error, it's part of the whole statistical system. So leave it alone, you don't need to test it. Some say, well, I mean, what if I have by chance imbalance? I wanna know, um, and, and if it is significant, I wanna put it as a covariate, so it's, it's done. And, and some people would say, and I'm talking statistician when I say some, uh, statisticians are disagreeing on this. Some people would say uh, that you're actually introducing bias when you look at the baseline characteristics, you pick all the ones where by chance there was an imbalance, by chance, and then you put those as covariates in your model. Because, and the logic being, okay, there is an imbalance, therefore I need to control for it. Some would say, that's, you shouldn't do that. Whatever you pre-specified as the covariate for your model, stick to that. And any imbalances is part of the whole type one error. So it's a, it's a complicated answer. It's a very good question. It's a complicated answer. And you will see, and I, I <laughs> you, are you asking if you see an imbalance, how, how badly are you messing up the results? You know, the, the, the easy way to do this, I, I'll tell you what I would do. I would do it both ways. <laughs> well, you have the primary analysis. So primary analysis is sacred. You know, you've got to do what you said you were going to do. That's, and I'm going to talk about this. That's, that's sacred. But there's nothing wrong by saying, you know, I looked at the baseline characteristics. I thought we did randomization good. And again, it depends also sample size. If sample size is large, you don't see, but we were talking about that. Uh, well, okay, never mind. Uh, so so uh, we did everything we could, and look, here's the, you know, the table one, and obviously there is a big difference in age or whatever. Uh, so I'm gonna do a sensitivity analysis, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this with the, with the the, imb the, imb the variable that has the imbalance inside the model to control for it. And let's see what we get. If you get the same results, you're lucky. 
that's great. Then you don't have to worry about it, right? With, without, it's the same. You're done. But if you get contradictory results, then, because some will argue, wait a second, you've got to stick to the primary, and others would argue, well, but you have an imbalance, you were right to put the covariate. So, my personal opinion is you stick with the primary and you let the, the stat system uh, do its thing. Yeah. Wouldn't you at least comment on this? Say when that again, please. Wouldn't you at least comment on this when you write your results? Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Even in, in, in some of the instances with when you have some influential observations and during the analysis you can do it with or without the observation, absolutely. just comment. But absolutely, and I, there was a question yesterday or before yesterday about that. You have an outlier and it's the same logic, it really is. Uh, you see something, one of the main messages, uh, the main messages to, that I'm gonna, my main message today is, if, you, if, if in your mind, if you're doing the right thing, if you see something and you're thinking as objectively as you can, remember the privilege, you think as objectively as you can and you do something that's logical, if it's logical, nobody's going to laugh at you if you write it in the manuscript, right? But if you hide it, and I have an example, people are going to say, wait a second. So don't hide it. And you don't have to write paragraphs and paragraphs. You can always say, we had two sentences. We had an outlier, and we tried to find out what was wrong, if it was a blah, 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 blah. Well, I say two sentences and then I go blah, blah, blah. But, <laughs> you know, you, you, we, we did all the best we can. We couldn't find why it's an outlier. So we did it with and without, and this is the result. But, you know, and let the reader decide. Transparency, to me, is extremely important because you are just saying what, and if it's logic, everybody's going to respect you for that because they would do the same thing, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, is English? There in English, yes, more or less English. That's fine. <laughs> is there any test that we can use to uh, exclude uh, an outlier uh, uh, result or, or an outlier data? Is there any test that can be used for that? Well, I mean, again, I mean, the, the, you cannot exclude an outlier up front and publish just the result with the outlier out. Yes. That, I would say no. That's so what I would say. There is no way you to put do it this in. You put it in. This is the primary. World, this is my primary. I said I was going to analyze everything, and that's everything. Now, if it's a mistake and all that, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Then you can say, for example, you know, uh, it was a mistake. There was no way for us to go back, fix it, and therefore, and we know it's a mistake because it's 10 times any possible value, so we took it out. Uh, but that's fine. Again, think about if you were to disclose everything, would anybody fault you or would anybody criticize you? Would anybody laugh at you? If the answer is no, then you're doing the right thing. If, if people would say, oh, wait a minute, you couldn't do that, then you're not doing something right. If you mm -hmm. came and told me, oh, you know, you see this analysis that I put in the abstract? By the way, it, it, it doesn't include three outliers. Yeah, I'm going to say, oh, hmm, hmm, <laughs> that's what I would say. Yeah. So now I don't, I, uh, I don't know, you know, I wonder what she did with those outliers. That's what I would say. But if you tell me, listen, this is the story with and without, then I would say, great, that I would have respect for that. Okay, thank you. I think we need... Uh, yeah, I was about to ask the same question. Can you make uh, like two analyses and present all of them with, with and without the, what, the outlier? Can yeah. you do that? Is that's it, what I'm is saying. Is it doable and it's As okay? long as you don't, as long as you're clear on what was pre-specified and primary and what is not. That's important. Not you put them together equally. No. You put, this is primary and this is without the outlier because the reasons. So... Uh, continuing on this, you can see another table one. 
where they have baseline characteristics and they put a p-value. So it is done. It's not, you know, the table I showed you earlier that didn't have a p-value that triggered your question, you say, oh, okay, I said, oh, good, they didn't do p-value. But then the table is actually very long, and if you go to the bottom, they say uh, no significant difference between <laughs> the, the variables. So they did do a p-value, but they didn't find anything statistically significant. Okay, number five clearly indicate the pre-specified primary hypothesis and the corresponding result in the body of the paper as well in the summary and abstract. You're gonna say, okay, blah, 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 yes, yes, of course. Well, you'll be surprised, you'll be surprised. The primary analysis is somewhere in the text, but it's not even in the abstract. The primary analysis, and that's to me is, is a no, absolutely no. This is, uh, you see this? It means it's good. You'll, you'll see this too. So here it says, I mean, I like the clarity of this abstract. It says, this study aimed to directly compare the effects of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, versus IPT, interpersonal psychotherapy, for the treatment of panic disorder with agoraphobia. Uh, fear of crowds, doctor, fear of crowds. Primary outcomes, you see, objective. Primary outcomes were panic attack frequency and idiosyncratic behavioral test. Primary outcome. Secondary outcomes were panic and agoraphobia, severity, panic-related cognitions, interpersonal functioning, and general psychopathology. Boom, boom, boom. Objective, primary, secondary. Very clear, can't get clearer than that. You say, well, doesn't everybody do that? Absolutely not, this is actually I would say is more an exception than the rule. Oh, I, okay, sorry about that. So results, I'm gonna do the whole thing and then I talk. Uh, the, the, this is how they wrote the results. Intent to treat analysis on the primary outcomes indicated superior effects of CBT in treating panic disorder with agoraphobia. Per protocol analysis, this is a real paper. I mean, it's really good. Uh, per pro I don't know about the results, but I'm talking about the presentation. Per protocol analyses emphasize the differences between treatments and yielded larger effect size. Reduction in the secondary outcomes. Blah, 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 blah. Very clear. You, you can't be confused. Number six. Clearly identify all secondary analyses, including subgroup analyses as such and as exploratory findings that need to be confirmed, indicate whether they were pre-specified. Very important, were they pre-specified? I know this guy, John Marler, he wrote, a well-reported secondary analysis must make clear to the reader the uncertainty of the result, so clear in fact that it should be an obvious part of the conclusions that implementation should await confirmation as the primary outcome in an adequately powered trial. Okay, you have to be very clear that this is secondary, this is hypothesis generating. We call it hypothesis generating. Basically, the information triggers other hypotheses that can be run for a specific trial. Do not highlight in the summary only what turned out to be statistically significant. Oh, I would never do that. Well, maybe you wouldn't, but it's, being, it's done. And I've seen it. Okay? People have lots of analyses in the text, maybe even including the primary, and in the abstract, only the significant results. So it's, you look at all the abstract, it looks like every trial was positive. I'm not kidding. It, it gives you that impression. Oh, yeah, the... the Weight has decreased by 20% with p-value of 0.04. Weight decrease was not the primary, but that was something they saw. Okay? So you say, oh, well, that's a positive trial. This is the example I wanted to give you, and I, wanna, I don't, not, don't wanna pick on, on Pfizer, but, but um, Okay, an important, medical, an important medical conference had just featured a study claiming that the new arthritis drug Celebrex 
was safer on the stomach than more established drugs. Now I'm going to get somebody who says, I'm working on Celebrex, and then correct me. Well, this is actually in the, in the New York Times. The truth was that Celebrex was no better at protecting the stomach from serious complications than other drugs. It appeared that way only because Pfizer and its partner, Pharmacia, presented the results from the first six months of the year-long study rather than the whole thing. Okay, that's one side of the story. I'm going to show you, to try to be objective and balanced, I'm going to show you what Pfizer said. Then and now, and this is all from the same New York Times article, so I didn't do any specific research. Then and now, Pfizer has defended its decision to release partial results from the 2000 study and denies any intent to deceive. And company officials have said that the drug has demonstrated its worth and safety. And Pfizer has argued that presenting the limited data was legitimate because so many people taking a comparison drug, diclofenac, dropped out, biasing the latter results. So in other words, Pfizer said, you know, the first six months has really almost complete data. A lot of people dropped out from the next six months, so we at Pfizer are showing you the first six months because the second six months is kind of messed up. Okay, I have a question for you. What should have Pfizer do? So you, you've heard both sides of the story. Somebody says, you hid some data from us. You, no, 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 you know, shame on you. And Pfizer is saying, no, no, we, we did something right because the second six months is all messed up. We just wanted to, we didn't want to show you something that's messed up. We're only showing you the first part. We don't know if it's true or not, I mean, wh whatever. But the, the point is, what's the lessons learned? What should have Pfizer do? 15 minutes. What? Do an entreat and to intend to treat analysis. Yeah? They, they should show both results. Yeah. They should show both results of yeah. them. Yeah, for I mean. For six months and for 12 months. Right. I mean, that's basically the same thing as what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it a little bit differently. It's just tell the story. Tell the, tell the full story. This is the first six months. This is what it shows. This is the second mix, six months. It's all messed up. There is a 50% dropout, blah, 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 blah. And that's why we don't consider this. But, you know, just to be clear and honest, if you do the first six months, and this is what we Pfizer think you ought to do, this is what you get, but if you mix them up and we think you should not do that, this is what you get. So disclosure, your pers Pfizer's recommendation, and it's out there, and then let the scientific community make their own. Then there's nothing to criticize Pfizer for, absolutely nothing. So anyways, okay. At least I wanna go through my, all my recommendations. Show the full picture, e.g. in a graph, over time with confidence interval, and include in the primary manuscript results of any sensitivity analysis. Very important. I'm going to show you a picture. I'm very happy to say this is one of our trials, and it was published by George Woody in JAMA in 2008 on adolescence. And basically, uh, let me try to do this. Uh, you've got two graphs, okay? Uh, that's the sensitivity analysis. One is the primary analysis based on observed data, and the other one is with the missing data imputed. Okay? That's number one. This is the number of opioid positive urine test results. So high is bad. You've got the two lines for the two treatment groups. The detox and the 12 week. You don't need to know the subject matter. But these are the two treatment groups. And it's over time. So remember, I showed you the full picture. You, you can see everything that's going on over time. So they showed it with the observed data and then with the imputation. So they're doing two things one, they're showing you the full picture, and two, they're doing the sensitivity analysis. It's all presented clearly. This is, this is what we have. 
and they have a, a, a nice little bonus. They actually tell you how many were at each time point. Rep oh, I, I, I like this one. Report the values of p-values, not intervals. I'm going to tell you what I mean. So avoid things like p less than 0.05 or p less than 0.01. This is thumbs down. You see it? Okay. So you put the star, you put the star, and you say in the footnote, p less than 0.05. You can't read it right here. You put the star, and p is less than 0.05. I don't like this at all. And this is the only table that doesn't have a reference. Uh, you know why it doesn't have an effort reference? Because I'm a co-author. And I didn't want to uh, criticize the, the lead author. Actually, I told her, uh, you know, I don't like this. Why don't we, can't we write the p-value? And she said, basically, the journal, the journal wants it this way. That was the answer. So I said, all right. And then I teach about not to do this. It's, it's ironic. So look at this table. Every comparison has the p-value shown, the actual p-value, not a star. And, and this, this table makes a, a very good example for my purposes. Do you see something? What, what are the two circles? Why am I highlighting those? I want feedback. Why am I highlighting those? The p-values are significant. What is it? The p-values are, are significant. The p-value are what? Were significant. Was significant. Both of them? No. Okay, so one is significant. Not significant. Not significant. Well, one is significant, the other one is not, right? Yeah. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Look at these numbers. One is just above 0.05 and one is just below 0.05. If you had to put a star, you put star, one would have gotten a star, the other one would not have gotten a star. And then, do you think that the, the results are very different? No. You think 0.05 is a magic thing, that everything below 0.05 is significant, and anything above 0.05, I mean, yeah, anything above 0.05 is not significant? There's this just magic uh, cutoff? No. No. But you would have never known if it was based on stars. You would have never known, because one would have gotten a star, the other one would not have. You would have never known, then one is just above, and the, one one is, the other one is just below. You would have never known. <laughs> then there is this example where you have lots of numbers, and because it's, uh, and, uh, when, when uh, Laura Lee showed, said, don't do statistical tests on correlation, I said, oh, gee, I have an example on statistical tests for correlations. Uh, but I didn't do it, Laura Lee, I didn't do it. Uh, so it's, it's the, the point of this table, it's a lot of uh, correlations and, 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 and it actually it's longer, it goes this way, it, it's actually longer than what I'm showing you because you wouldn't be able to read it. But then they decided to go with stars and that's why I say it's okay. So it's not a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah? You have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. We have 10 minutes. Well. <laughs> At least I want to finish my recommendations. <laughs> and, that, uh, and back in your... Uh, the previous the last, one? Uh, yes, the previous one. And uh, when we have a result like this, P0.06, uh, uh, I'm very happy with this because I, I, I also uh, put this in, in, in my papers, but always afraid because for us, the, the number, the magic number, 0, 0 0.5, said, okay, it's significant or not significant. Hmm? Yeah. But uh, we can use the, the word tendency to have a difference between groups when we have more than uh, 0 0.05, or it's not, so, it's not necessary, because it, it's not signif significant. 
You know, I, I read a lot about no-nos on how to write p-values that are close to 0.05 or very low, like 0.001, adjectives. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's a 10, it's very much, it's too much, anything that you, and, and, and there's all kind. I've read so many views that I'm even confused what's right and what's wrong. But, so I would say, just state the facts. You can always say in your language or in English, you know, uh, the p-value was 0.06, it's pretty close to 0.05. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, well, we don't have time, but, but th th there are all kinds of things that you should not, the way to say it, you should, it should, should not be said this way. And yeah, okay. And then, and that's my favorite, and that's why you see a, a smiling face. <laughs> they give you the p-value and they put a star. So they say, you know, 0.016 for readers, I just want to clarify that 0.016 is less than 0.05. <laughs> it's just true. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I, when I saw that. They said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make both people happy. I'm going to put the p-value and I'm going to put the star. Just cover all bases. I, I, I just laughed at that. Okay. Ah. Okay, report the, p the value of the treatment effect and the corresponding confidence interval. Similarly for all important outcomes. The whole point is, is here, don't give me an F value, a degrees of freedom, a P value, and I'm done. No, so what? Tell me what's the treatment effect, what's the confidence interval around it, so translate it back to the clinical. Remember, this is a clinical trial. This is not a statistical paper. This is a clinical trial. So you need to translate it back to, to, to clinical language. And that's what this point is about. Oh, oh, well, both points are about. Translate the statistical results into simple English, clinical terms, simple language, clinical terms in the results, and explain the impact of these results on clinical practice. I'm going to, this is an example because I want to at least go through the recommendations. Uh, so when you have multiple tests, my personal suggestion is, you know, for the primary analysis, you have to do an official adjustment for multiplicity. By official, using a statistical method to adjust for multiplicity for the primary analysis if it has several hypotheses, okay? But, for, I'm not going to talk about this, be, okay. But for secondary analyses, you know, or exploratory analyses, indicate in your paper how many you've done to give the reader a sense of, you know, I've done five secondary analyses on this, this, and this, and these are the results, and, let, and give the p-values, and let the reader do their multiplicity if they want to. Remember, secondary analyses are kind of suggestive. There are hypothesis generating. But if you did 200 secondary analysis and you're reporting three, it is your responsibility to say that so that the reader knows. And the last recommendation, most importantly, co-authorship should be based on substantial contribution to the conception, the design, or the analysis of the study. There's a whole thing about uh, uh, authorship. So. These are basically my, my three bottom line messages. Uh, clinically relevant research question. If the question is important, the answer is important. So think about that. You know, uh, th you know it's, it's worth every minute to, to, to discuss this point. Pre-specification, very, very important. And disclosure, meaning transparency. Trans you know what transparency means? You're, you're basically showing what you've done. I just want to, I just want to, since I have five minutes, I'm just going to show you one of the papers. I know you all read very carefully the two both papers last night. Uh, so I apologize for that. This is from the second paper. This is from the second paper, the Mason paper. 
And this is a graph in the, in the manuscript. And what are we looking at? Uh, days per week of marijuana use. So high is bad. Gabapentin is a medication, placebo. Days per week of marijuana use. You've got a longitudinal, which is a very good longitudinal. Uh, it gives the full picture, so good for them. And then you've got confidence interval, good for them. Bar chart. Uh, and then p-value, 0.004. Wow, great. Okay, so I, I, because this is a paper that came to me, it wasn't meant to be an example in the course or anything, so this is part of my work, so I'm reviewing this. 0.004, wow, that's, that's pretty good. Um, what is significant? What does it show? Um, okay, uh, maybe, you know, uh, gabapentin has fewer days of use of marijuana use. So I look and I say, yeah, fewer, fewer, fewer. But here it's, wait a minute, it's more. Oh, okay. And it looks pretty close. If you look at the confidence interval, I don't think they separate. So that's not it. Okay. So then I thought, okay, uh, maybe it's the slope are different. Oh, well, it doesn't look like the slopes are different. So I look at the graph and I say, I don't know what is the 0.004 about? So I read the paper very carefully. I said, okay, well, they put the picture, they put the p-value. I'm sure they explain it in the paper. So I went to the paper, uh, well, I was reading the paper and I read it twice very carefully. This is the only thing that they say in the paper about this figure, okay? Gabapentin relative to placebo, okay? So we can't say the slope is significant for both. We, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if you say the slope is significant for both, if that's what the 0.004 is all about, even though that's not the primary point of the trial, right? The primary point of the trial is to compare the two, not to, to see if the slope for both arms together is, is significant, okay? so. But if you read the paper, it does say, relative to placebo, gabapentin also significantly decreased the number of days of use of marijuana per week. F is 8.66, degrees of freedom is 96. I thought F had two degrees of freedom, but that's another story. P-value is 0.004. That's it. So I read the text, I look at the graph, I read the text, I look at the graph, and I have no idea what this is about. It was never translated into English or into simple clinical language. That's all it's written. And that's just to illustrate, I'm not picking on the author, or maybe I am, I don't know. Uh, but it's just to illustrate the, the, the point that, you know, translate things into, into clinical terms. We have one minute, two minutes, one minute. Can you ask a question in 30 seconds and I need to respond in 30 seconds, 28. Any question? You want the pastries and the coffee, I know. Okay, thank you very much.